Welcome to Podcast on the Brink, your weekly dose of Indiana basketball news and discussion, brought to you by the Assembly Call and Inside the Hall. I'm your host, Jared Morris. Join me live at assemblycall.com every Thursday night and immediately following every IU game for our live IU postgame show. And visit insidethehall.com for complete coverage of IU basketball and to join the discussion in the Inside the Hall premium forum. On this week's edition of Podcast on the Brink, Alex Bozich and I are joined by one of our favorite Big Ten beat writers, Dylan Burkhart from UM Hoops and the Moving Screen Podcast, who is here to help us take a look ahead to Indiana's big game on Friday against Michigan. We talk about what Indiana needs to do differently so that this result goes better than the uh, the first result against Michigan, why Indiana might be facing this Michigan team at a good time. Um, we talk through some of Michigan's personnel, talk about John Beeline, and also reflect back on the beginning of John Beeline's tenure at Michigan, which a lot of people have you know kind of brought up as a, a reason for patience with Archie. Uh, and how those uh, situations are different and you know how they're similar, what we can learn from it. So all of that coming on this really insightful uh, conversation, really insightful episode here of Podcast on the Brink. Before we get to that, though, let's talk about gear because this week's episode of Podcast on the Brink is brought to you by our friends at Home Field. And at homefieldapparel.com, you will find the comfiest and the most unique licensed IU apparel that's available anywhere. Home Field was started by an IU grad, and all Home Field apparel is designed and printed out of Indianapolis. And with the Big Ten season upon us, we're <laughs> right in the thick of it, obviously. You should check out Home Field's IU Big Ten Champions tee. Remember, better times. Uh, it features IU's five championship years, national championship years, uh, which, of course, is a feat that no other Big Ten school has accomplished. I also highly recommend the hoodie, the tri-blend hoodie with the old IU Bison logo. I have it and I wear it as much as I possibly can because it's very, very comfortable. And of course, when you're there, don't forget to use the promo code BRINK, B-R-I-N-K, at checkout for 15% off your first order at homefieldapparel.com. That's promo code BRINK at homefieldapparel.com. Home Field, wear one for the team. And now, here's our conversation with Dylan Burkhart. And we are joined this week on Podcast on the Brink by Dylan Burkhart, publisher of UM Hoops and one of the hosts of a new podcast that I highly recommend everybody listen to, the Moving Screen podcast. It covers Michigan and Michigan State basketball, um, but those are the two best teams in the Big Ten right now, so it's, uh, it's worth keeping tabs on them, and they also do a great uh, Big Ten power rankings at the end, so just wanted to give a plug for that. Uh, but Dylan, welcome to Podcast on the Brink. It's great to have you here. Thanks for having me, guys. Absolutely. So... Obviously, a big game. You know, one of the reasons uh, we wanted to have you on now is Indiana plays Michigan on Friday. The Hoosiers, you know, coming off of five straight losses, desperately needing a win. I think some people are kind of looking at this Michigan team right now. They've been such a juggernaut all year, but, you know, they just lost to Wisconsin, their first loss, you know, only beat Minnesota by two. So all of us that are grasping at straws for reasons why Indiana can win a game maybe think Indiana might be catching Michigan at a good time. Do you do you buy into that as we look ahead to Friday? Yeah, it's pretty crazy to think about these two teams met like three weeks ago, two weeks ago, and they were undefeated in the Big Ten. It had all the feelings of a big game, and now they're not quite feeling as invincible as they were. Uh, I would definitely say that Indiana's in a good spot as far as Michigan is playing probably as poorly as it's played all year kind of facing that first little bit of adversity and now Indiana is going to be at home desperately needs a win it's definitely not a terrible spot for Indiana to get a bounce back win what do you think I mean as you as you look at this game what do you think are the keys you know especially reflecting on what I mean obviously getting off to a good start you know we understand that killed Indiana and you got to keep Romeo and Juwan on the court but what are some things Indiana needs to do differently for this result to be different yeah it's that first game was really just a two different games almost. Michigan came out and jumped all over Indiana. They had the two quick fouls. And then if you actually go back and watch the second half, it was pretty much even back and forth. Indiana made some defensive adjustments. Michigan was obviously in a position where they didn't need to do anything too crazy. But what that game came down to for me was Michigan's ball screen action. And Indiana kind of had a hard time covering that early. But in the second half, they adjusted. And what we've seen in the last couple games is teams are being really, well, I guess you would say they're not being aggressive. They're just going under every ball screen and really kind of daring Xavier Simpson to beat them. And that's given Michigan 
kind of a few hiccups here in the last couple of games. Dylan, I talked to you as much as anybody about Big Ten hoops, and we've had our fair share of back and forth about our preseason picks to win the Big Ten. Obviously, I went with Michigan. You went with Indiana. Uh, obviously, my pick is looking, I don't know, great right now, but better than yours. Uh, I'm just curious from your perspective, and I know you look at the numbers a lot. I know you look at kind of every Big Ten team and have good insight on all of them. Just Indiana right now, what do you see as maybe the, the one or two things that sticks out as, as why they're uh, currently in the midst of a five-game losing streak and there's not a whole lot of reasons for optimism right now? optimism right now? Well, they've played five games in a little over two weeks, and four of them have been on the road. That's probably the first reason. I think a lot of times in the Big Ten, we get caught up in momentum and sort of who's playing well at any given time, and when in reality it comes down to who you're playing and where you're playing. Um, There probably aren't too many teams that would have done much better than 0-5 if they went at Michigan at Maryland, Nebraska at home, at Purdue, at Northwestern. It's not like they lost to Rutgers or something like that, which we have seen from other Big Ten teams and they're losing streaks. So I think it's just a brutal stretch of schedule, and that's where I would have to start. But then you just look at kind of the same problem that Michigan's having. They can't make threes, and they're shooting just 27% from three in Big Ten games. Even if you have two amazing finishers, you got to be able to space the floor eventually when you have Big Ten defenses kind of coached up. Do you think, you know, one thing I've written about a lot lately is just the defense. Like the first, I think, 14 games, only three teams scored over a point per possession against IU. And obviously obviously some of that is scheduled when you're playing those guarantee games. Not a lot of teams are capable of that. But then the last five, they've all, all those teams have given up, have scored more than a point per possession. And I, I think the most notable of those is Northwestern because they came in really as kind of a putrid offense and they put one point, I think, 08 against IU. The defense, do you think that's something uh, that's more a product of the schedule or, or maybe a bigger trend of, of something uh, you know that Indiana may not be able to turn around at this point? So I did not see the whole Indiana-Northwestern game. Um, Michigan also played that night. But I, when you, if you can't score – a point per possession is kind of falls off the cliff at the end. I would say you look at uh, that Indiana, like you're giving up a little over a point per possession, but it was really those Michigan and Maryland games where Indiana got blitz defensively. And I think they're kind of trending back in the right direction, you could say. And they just haven't been able to keep up. I mean, 0. 0.79 points per possession against Nebraska, 0. 0.86, 0. 0.97. Those are not good enough to win a Big Ten game and I think a lot of times if you get to a late game situation those fluctuating right around one those point possession numbers can kind of skew the big picture. I want to ask you about Ignis Brezdakis um, who obviously has been one of the big stars for Michigan this year you know played so well early in the season it 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 feels just from kind of watching from afar like maybe he hit a little bit of a wall the last few games. Obviously had the you know the no points against Wisconsin, but then bounced back a little bit against Minnesota. Um, eighteen points got to the free throw line, and and at the same time you know Romeo Langford. I mean they've been the two best freshmen in the conference, and he's had his two you know kind of biggest struggles these last couple of games. Is this something where you see you know uh, Brezdakis hitting a little bit of a wall, or teams defending him differently, and how do you kind of project him forward for the rest of the year? So what's interesting with Brasdakis is is a lot of his production came from the residual action of the rest of Michigan's offense. It wasn't necessarily that they were drawing up sets for him every time down the court. It was more along the lines of the ball screen ends with a kick out to Brasdakis on the wing, and he can either shoot or drive or get fouled. And as you get into the Big Ten, you see more and more teams Teams have a more coherent strategy for how they want to defend ball screens. Um, In the non-conference, you're really just building that base and you are kind of just playing your base coverages. And then as teams scout up in the Big Ten, you really kind of see, okay, well, we're not going to let him drive because he's very much a drive first player. And as teams have done that, his three-point shooting has regressed pretty heavily. He's shooting like 28% from three and Big 10 games and that's just if you can't make that shot you're not going to ever convince a defender that they have to come out and play you out there 
And I think that's probably the same thing with Romeo Langford. It's easy to have to mask some deficiencies when you're kind of coasting through non-conference season. It's just Big Ten brings out the truth in a lot of these. You're playing against good teams every night, and they've never really been through that as freshmen. The guy on Michigan that, to me, is the most compelling this year is Xavier Simpson, who, you know, when you go back and look at his freshman stats, nothing about them jumps out and says, you know, this guy is going to be a really important player as an upperclassman, and yet now you look at him as a junior, you know, people are talking about him as a first-team All Big Ten type player, despite not necessarily having the numbers for it, but because of his impact. Can you kind of describe his growth and why he's so important to this Michigan team in ways that go beyond the numbers? Yeah, so two years ago... Derek Walton was Michigan's point guard and Simpson was coming in as a freshman and was basically supposed to be his backup. And he couldn't really even play that role reliably. Um, He really struggled. He couldn't score. He finally had a few good moments late in the year, but it was one of those situations where you're wondering if he was going to be good enough to be Michigan's next point guard long-term. He, they brought in a graduate transfer, Jaron Simmons last year and Many expected he would start. Simpson won the job, then lost the job. And then by the end of the year, he had won it back. And he turned into really Michigan's starting point guard all down the stretch. And it became clear that he was just an elite defender. He is also really the core leader of this team. And you've seen him kind of grow into more of a playmaker with the ball in as far as his passing ability, but his weakness is really just that his perimeter shot comes and goes he hit five of ten threes against northwestern and he hit a bunch of threes back against uh george washington and michigan's early season tournament but he's barely hit any threes in any other games so more and more teams are just cheating off of him and he's such a good passer and he's so quick that you can't allow him to beat you in those regards one of the more interesting developments I feel like over the last season and a half in, in Big Ten basketball in general is is Michigan's defense and how, you know, before it wasn't really a, I don't want to say a priority, but Michigan won a ton of games, uh, you know, the, in the previous years just by having an elite offense. And now it's, the offense is, is still good, but the defense is really what carries this program. And I know there's been a lot written about uh, the assistant coach, uh, Luke Yaklich, coming over and him kind of being the quote-unquote defensive coordinator. But from a schematic standpoint or kind of what's changed defensively, what like how, how, I guess, did he kind of reshape this defense and why is Michigan's defense so good? So I wouldn't say that the schematics of the whole defense have changed that dramatically. I would say they're doing probably what they wanted to do before just doing it better and a big reason for that is that they have Xavier Simpson Charles Matthews and John Teske who are probably the best defenders that John Beeline has had at any of those three positions so if you have a great guard defender a great wing defender and a great interior defender you're going to be a lot better on defense um he they're I guess the one big sort of analytical thing that they do is they try to take away the three-point shot Um, That's been kind of a priority even since Billy Donlin came for a year as an assistant, and they've really tried to allow fewer three-point attempts over anything and just try to force tough twos. For a while, they were taking away threes but giving up layups. Now they've kind of started to get in the area where they can actually force those tough twos. And I just think at the end of the day, it comes down to having great individual defenders and leaders that can get that buy-in across the board and that would be Simpson and Matthews really holding that all together Matthews specifically this season you know he I think flirted with the NBA last year and his results this year have kind of been up and down is he a guy you're looking at the rest of the the year how he plays is that going to have any how much bearing will that have on whether or not Michigan's able to you know go back to a final four and and kind of what's his role in this team so he's a great defender and that carries Michigan almost through every game but his offense just fluctuates all over the map I mean if he hits a couple early threes all of a sudden Michigan's off to the races that was basically what happened in the first Indiana game Um, he has had a lot of struggles this year in the mid-range and kind of getting to the basket and then finishing at the basket he 
loves to do this jump stop pivot fade away when he gets in the paint and it's just his consistency really hurts Michigan offensively because on his day he can dominate a game against basically anyone I mean he's really kind of got fired up for big matchups whether it was their game at Villanova whether it was the Indiana game um North Carolina game and he looks great last year in the NCAA tournament he looked great last year throughout most of the Big Ten season he really struggled so it's just kind of finding that right blend and Michigan doesn't really have a go-to option so it can kind of be any given player on any given night but sometimes they can't find who that player should be Dylan, I want to actually take you back to when John Beeline first took over at Michigan. Because, you know, for Indiana, five-game losing streak. Obviously, last year wasn't very good. So, you know, in some uh, segments of the fan base, this has become a bit of a crisis point with the Archie Miller era. And, you know, what's often cited is guys like Jay Wright and John Beeline and on and on, guys who struggled in their first few years. You know, Beeline goes 10-22 and 22 his first year. The second year, they made the NCAA tournament, lost in the second round. And then the third year, 15-17. and 17. What kind of caused some of those early struggles? And was there kind of clamoring in the fan base then? And what then helped him kind of get things turned around to where they've been so much more stable over the last seven, eight years? Well, first things first, uh, Michigan basketball is not quite Indiana basketball. The expectations are very different. And Michigan hadn't been to the tournament for well over a decade when John Beeline got there. So the situation in the program... Patients. Was- <laughs> was very different. They didn't have a practice facility. They didn't have any of this stuff. So he was really building it from square one, which is a role he has always been comfortable in and what he kind of wanted to do. Um, but no one was really, I don't know. It's easier to get through with a 10 and 22 season your first year at Michigan than a lot of other places. Uh, and then from there, I think the more interesting time would probably be the year after they first made the NCAA tournament. Because then you had some expectations, things kind of went sideways, um, and they were able to really his fourth year, they were on a one and six in the Big Ten. They'd lost six games in a row, and they ended up going to Michigan State and winning, and that turned basically the whole program around. From that point, they ended up making the NCAA tournament, and then the next year they ended up sharing the Big Ten title. So that was, I guess proof that you can weather one of those long losing streaks and again you look at the back of that season and they were losing like at Kansas it wasn't like they were losing bad games and sometimes the schedule just creeps up on you and it creates this wave of negative momentum I would say yeah you you know you mentioned that you know big part of the reason why Indiana is is probably struggling is the schedule and obviously you know two of the next three games are against Michigan and Michigan State so the schedule doesn't get any easier right now but we've all kind of looked towards February as a time when the schedule opens up, more home games. You know, you're not playing, you know, some of the top teams quite as much. What gives you some hope or some optimism that Indiana will turn this thing around? And they're surely not going to fulfill your preseason prediction for them. But you know, no. what what gives you some optimism? Maybe you know, from an objective standpoint, that we'll see better play out of this team. I think they still have the talent at the top, but I just don't know where they come to. You need some sort of third option, and I have not seen it. Maybe that comes to be, but I don't know. I mean, I think that they have enough talent to beat, to win some games, and they probably have one of the best home court advantages. I don't know. Yeah, obviously the ceiling's probably capped on this year, but when you consider all the injuries, everything they've been through, there's still got to be some sort of, if you can weather, I guess, this next week, right? trip to the Breslin's not going to be all that fun, but uh, no. you can get through that. You're looking at more of a situation where you can, they're manageable games. You can string a little momentum together and then maybe you can bring along some of those extra pieces. I would say that would be the best bet. And Romeo Langford and Juwan Morgan are still pretty good. So they can get you something done. I would say in terms of the big 10 at large right now, <clears throat> I'm still sticking to my Michigan pick, even though it's maybe not looking as great right now with Michigan State just kind of dominating people, even without Joshua Lankford. It's it's kind of scary. I'll stick with my pick of the Spartans. Just going to throw that out there. What what they could do once he's back. Is this, in your mind, a two-team race at this point, or is there anyone else that can realistically challenge? So I would say Michigan State is definitely the favorite right now, just when you consider how – easy Michigan's 
Big Ten schedule has been to this point and how hard it is going to be on the back half. But you also have a lot of games down the stretch that could determine that. I guess you would say Maryland, Purdue are still in the mix. Um, Michigan has to play Maryland and Michigan State twice, really, in the final two or three weeks of the season. That is a stretch that will have a lot of consequences. But I would say right now it's Michigan State in the driver's seat and Michigan probably right behind them. Who in the Big Ten, obviously we talked a lot about Indiana, maybe a, you know, a team right now that's kind of in the middle of the pack that has a good record, looks like they're trending towards the Big Ten. Is there anyone that you're, you think right now is kind of maybe – outplayed their expectations or a team that has a chance to maybe falter down the rest of the season because I'm looking at the at the standings right now and Ken Palm projections there's I think one two three four five six at least seven teams projected to win 10 games Uh, and I'm I'm just kind of curious if you think there's anyone in that middle of the pack that is going to come maybe back down to earth uh, this last month and a half of the season yeah it's it's interesting because I think you could say that the teams that have kind of risen above the pack are Maryland, Purdue, and Wisconsin. Um, I don't ever quite trust Iowa, and I don't know, I guess, where Nebraska is at right now. Um, I know there's a lot of pressure there for Tim Miles to get to the NCAA tournament again. It seemed like everything was heading in the right direction the way they played at Assembly Hall. I guess that was last week. But now it looks like, well, maybe this is going to be a little more difficult than we thought. They have a pretty tough schedule remaining, and it's just kind of brutal that, like, you look at the end of their schedule, they have to host Purdue and then play games at Michigan and at Michigan State late in the season. That's not a great spot to be in when you're playing for your postseason hopes. So. I would say Nebraska might be the one just because I'm not really sure what to expect from them on any given night. We got asked on our show um, a couple weeks ago to put together an all Big Ten team. And, you know, based on the start of the season, it seemed pretty easy to start with Carson Edwards, Ethan Happ, and Cassius Winston. And the challenge then was figuring out the next two guys. And I especially had a hard time when I got to Michigan because it felt like you could make an argument for so many guys. You know, they just, they've kind of been so balanced. How would you? I mean, I'm assuming those would be your that the, you would put those three on there. But tell me if not, how would you finish up your All Big Ten team, and where would you kind of you know put a a Michigan guy like who would kind of stand out above the rest? It's really hard to put a Michigan guy on the All Big Ten team because if you were to ask me any week who the most important Michigan player is, it changes. In the last week, it's been John Teske. Early in the year, you wouldn't even think of saying that. Um. So I don't see it really a situation where a Michigan guy can end up on the all big 10 team just because of how the roster is shaped in terms of the final two spots. That's a tough one. Um, So you have Winston, Hap, Edwards. That was, that was year three. Yeah. Um, I guess you probably look in the direction of who else finishes near the top of the league. I don't know if that's like a Maryland guy, like a Cowan or Fernando. They've both been really good. Um, that's tricky. I don't know. And it's hard. There's like 10 guys that you could probably Nick make an argument Ward, for. Like you could go in a lot of ways. Um, and I think it will probably be a pretty split ballot, you would think. It'd almost be three consensus guys. And then I would, I don't know. That's that's a tricky question. Who Who would you go with, Alex? Yeah, Alex. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, don't, I mean, <laughs> Nick Ward, I think, deserves probably a spot. Um, and this is just me, but I would have somebody on Michigan on there. I mean, I, you know, I don't care about numbers specifically. I care about who the best teams are. And right now I'm looking at Michigan, what they've done. They've lost one game. Uh, I don't know how you penalize them for having a balanced Team. So if I was picking somebody from Michigan, I know he's not played great lately. Um, Jordan Poole, maybe. Uh, I don't. Or maybe Simpson or Matthews, since they've been keyed by defense this year. Right. But but I mean, you can't put you you can't put a you can't put a a guy from a team that's not in the top half of the Big Ten right now on the first team. That's just unless the numbers 
are so incredible that it's like off the charts. I just don't see any real rationale for that. And and Michigan, I mean, they lost one game. I mean, what, and I know it's been like a little bit of a down uh, spot for them recently with the loss at Wisconsin and and having to beat Minnesota at the buzzer, but. I mean, it's probably, been it's probably just a philosophical thing with how you, you know, is this for the that, best five a, individual performances? It's an individual award. Yeah, that's so. Well, well, that's but see, that's my problem sometimes with these lists and these awards and the preseason specifically. You have some media members and I don't want to get into names or anything, but they'll <laughs> open up the Athlon preview and they'll look at what someone averaged last season or their rebounds. And that's how you get things like Jordan Murphy and Tyler Cook on all these all preseason teams. I mean, those numbers and Jared, we've had this argument too. This is one reason why I didn't have Jawan Morgan on my preseason all big 10 team. It's like, those numbers are great, but like, what did they contribute to in terms of success for a team? Um, You know, they're not NCAA tournament teams. um, And last year, at least those, those three guys didn't play in a tournament team. So I wouldn't put them kind of in the same conversation uh, because you know, I, I value winning more and I value efficiency more than I do a guy like Jordan Murphy putting up a school record in double doubles. Like what what did he actually accomplish other than yeah. playing a stat sheet? He didn't help his team win games. I mean, I value the efficiency. It's somewhat hard to pin winning on just one guy when so much of that can be dependent on the rest of the circumstances in the team. I mean it's it's a balance, I think. But yeah. I think you look at Ward and Cowan. I think that would probably be the team that would get filled if you picked it right now that would probably be the group that would win it i would say yeah right but what i'm saying is the three of us or you know people that look at the analytics would probably have a difference of opinion than say a random beat writer that covers Rutgers and isn't looking at ken palm stats or efficiency numbers they may just say wow jordan murphy has 16 double doubles i'm going to put him on the first team and that's kind of what i'm saying i don't agree with kind of that approach but that's how we get silly things like also the AP poll where there's random things like people leaving off teams that haven't played a road game and all that kind of stuff. So I'll, I, one thing yeah. I do want to ask you, Dylan, is in the preseason, I don't think any of us in this conversation would have said the Big Ten was going to be this good. Like I, I didn't look at it and say, wow, this is going to be a team or a league that could potentially get eight, nine, ten teams in the tournament. Do you think at this point people are over kind of – estimating how good the big like do you really think the big 10 is as good as people are talking about or do you think it's a case of you know there's some solid teams maybe in the middle but but maybe not as great as everyone is is saying yeah i think it's kind of the league of seven to ten seeds there's going to be a lot of uh those sort of teams that make the ncaa tournament but probably aren't really favored to get to the second weekend um is are Michigan and Michigan State legit? Maybe. Um, I think that they are. They have teams. They're good enough to be in that conversation to make a deep run. Are Maryland and Purdue that good? Mm, I'm not really that convinced. Um, same with Wisconsin, Iowa. Like those teams probably will do enough to make the tournament. Maybe even get up to a six or a five seed. But I I don't really see the league did play well in the non conference, and that's going to boost everything up. But I'm not. It doesn't remind me of, I guess, five years, five, six years ago when the league was loaded with teams that should all be kind of considered national contenders. I don't know if I really see that level of talent in the league. Just a lot of really well-coached teams that have enough talent. Last question for you, Dylan. You know, whenever anybody talks about the best coaches in college basketball now, John Beeline gets mentioned, and rightfully so. You know, what he's done has been incredible. As you're just watching games, like what is your favorite thing, you know, aesthetically or tactically about watching a John Beeline team that as Indiana fans get ready to watch this game on Friday, obviously we hope that Indiana wins the game, but you know, that a smart basketball fan would really appreciate. It's funny because two years ago, the answer would be completely different. And that kind of speaks to, I guess, Beeline's new found ability to adapt because Two years ago, it would be watching the offense and how well they space the floor and how they have shooters at every position. This year, if you want to be, in, if you want to enjoy watching Michigan play, you need to uh, enjoy watching guys just get after it on defense and just watch Xavier Simpson play defense for the entire game. Um, that 
is probably the most impressive thing about Beeline at this point is that he has been able to adapt and he kind of had a reputation, I would say, a decade ago of not really being like that. And just kind of seeing that transformation over the last five years has probably been the most interesting thing for me. Well, for you listening, if you want to keep up with Michigan, definitely check out umhoops.com. And again, I highly recommend the Moving Screen podcast. Even if you're not you know, huge into Michigan and Michigan State, they do Big Ten power rankings at the end of every episode. So that is definitely worth a listen. But really enjoy the work that you guys do on that show. And it's uh, great to have you on podcast on the brink, Dylan. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for having me, guys. Yep. Thanks, Dylan. Thank you for listening to this episode of Podcast on the Brink. We always appreciate you being here. Remember to join me and my co-hosts for more IU basketball talk at assemblycall.com and visit Alex over at insidethehall.com for complete coverage of Indiana basketball. If you want to support Podcast on the Brink, here is the single best way to do it. Tell anyone you know who loves IU hoops about us and suggest that they subscribe. Podcast on the Brink can be found on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else podcasts are available. Tell your social media followers, email your friends, text your family members. For weekly discussion about IU basketball, they need to be subscribed to Podcast on the Brink. We'll talk to you next time. Go Hoosiers!